about uh, dialysis uh, and how uh, it can be used as a renal replacement therapy in chronic kidney disease. Dialysis is required for the treatment of uh, uh, both acute and chronic uh, kidney disease and today uh, the main emphasis uh, would be about the role of dialysis uh, in chronic renal failure. Once the patient uh, reaches uh, advanced renal failure or what we call as uh, end stage kidney failure, uh, some form of uh, renal replacement therapy uh, is required to sustain life. The options for renal replacement therapy are uh, uh, either dialysis or kidney transplantation. And uh, dialysis is of two types. One is hemodialysis and the other is uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, hemodialysis uh, is a life-saving uh, procedure uh, which sustains life for uh, patients who have end-stage kidney failure and uh, approximately more than one million patients throughout this world uh, are sustained uh, on hemodialysis as a life-saving device. Without uh, uh, availability of dialysis, uh, most of these patients uh, would die within a few weeks of stopping the uh, dialysis. The uh, various causes of end-stage uh, renal failure or end-stage kidney disease uh, include uh, uh, diabetes or uh, chronic uh, uh, hypertension and chronic glomerulonephritis. Diabetes mellitus uh, is currently responsible for more than 55% of uh, newly diagnosed cases of end-stage kidney failure who uh, require uh, dialysis as a renal replacement therapy. And uh, uh, approximately 33% of patients who have end-stage renal failure, uh, they have uh, end-stage kidney failure because of hypertension on what we call as hypertensive uh, kidney disease. Other uh, causes of uh, end-stage uh, renal disease include uh, glomerulonephritis, uh, some of the uh, hereditary diseases like polycystic uh, kidney disease, uh, interstitial disease uh, as a result of obstructive uropathy, uh, stone disease and uh, other uh, uh, similar diseases. But overall, uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, slide, diabetes uh, uh, and hypertension, they, they are the two important cause of end-stage uh, kidney failure. And diabetes uh, is actually uh, spreading like uh, an epidemic throughout the world. And even in the developing world, uh, the diabetic uh, kidney disease uh, is actually now uh, is the cause of uh, more than 50 to 60 percent of patients uh, who are on uh, maintenance uh, uh, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And there is a trend uh, that uh, the uh, end-stage renal disease uh, is slowly increasing uh, throughout the world. If you can see the uh, the uh, incidence of end stage renal failure, this has been uh, increasing uh, uh, continuously uh, in the last uh, 20 decades from 150 uh, million uh, per year to almost going up to 350 uh, million patients in, uh, who have end stage uh, kidney failure. Historically, uh, the earliest dialysis was actually done uh, in the uh, 18th century uh, when a Scottish professor of chemistry uh, invented the fundamental process of uh, separating uh, solutes by using semi-permeable membrane and uh, uh, he coined uh, Gram, uh, the word dialysis. But, uh, 
practically for treating uh, uh, kidney failure in 1916, uh, a bell uh, did uh, dialysis in experimental animals, in rabbits and dogs, with a device using uh, celloidin membrane and a leech extract. Uh, Hirudin was used as an anticoagulant. Uh, in 1924 in Germany, uh, Haas was uh, actually the first uh, uh, medical person who dialyzed a human being, uh, but uh, the patient uh, did not survive for very long. Uh, William Kolf uh, in 1944 uh, succeeded in using uh, an extracorporeal dialysis system to support patients uh, who had uh, acute kidney failure, and William Kolf is called father of uh, uh, hemodialysis. If you uh, uh, interpret the meaning of dialysis, uh, which is a Greek word, uh, which actually means uh, dissolution, and one can uh, uh, define dialysis as a process by which the solute, uh, uh, they really move along with uh, the fluid across a semi-permeable uh, membrane and uh, uh, in this process uh, one can remove waste uh, products and excess water from the blood and uh, 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 basically the blood is separated from the uh, other compartment which has the dialysis fluid running uh, and across the semi-permeable membrane uh, there is movement of uh, excess water and the waste product. Uh, so this is an artificial replacement uh, of uh, the lost kidney function because the kidney basically is uh, removing the waste products and the uh, uh, excess water uh, from the body uh, and through the urine. So it's an artificial way uh, to replace the kidney function which is lost as a result of uh, a chronic uh, kidney disease. The goal of dialysis is to remove uh, essentially the accumulated fluid and toxins and to maintain the body uh, homeostasis uh, uh, more so uh, with the idea that the uh, various so-called uremic symptoms which appear as a result of uh, end-stage kidney failure are ameliorated. The dialysis is uh, generally initiated in chronic renal failure when the chronic uh, kidney disease uh, gets far advanced and uh, if the uh, kidney function is down to less than GFR of 10 to 15 ml uh, per minute, uh, then uh, uh, the dialysis uh, need to be started as an option uh, for replacing uh, kidney function. But uh, there are situations where uh, people can start dialysis even earlier because early dialysis uh, uh, also helps in preventing the complications of uh, end-stage uh, kidney failure which involves uh, the other vital organs like the cardiovascular system, the neurological systems, and the bones and other uh, important uh, organs in our body. These are the uh, 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 indications for uh, dialysis which can be summed up as uh, uh, fluid overload, uh, 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 hyperkalemia if the serum potassium is high, uh, metabolic uh, acidosis, hyperphosphatemia, hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia, uh, anemia, neurological uh, uh, dysfunction, uh, pericarditis, uh, uh, even gastrointestinal intestinal, uh, manifestations like nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, uh, they are also uh, indications for starting dialysis. Severe hypertension, especially if it is because of the uh, salt and water overload. And uh, if these patients uh, who have chronic kidney disease, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they become malnourished, then they should be considered uh, for dialysis even earlier, even in the absence of 
uh, other uh, uh, indications for starting dialysis. Uh, in terms of the principles of dialysis, basically uh, uh, dialysis involves uh, uh, two processes. One is diffusion and the other is uh, convection, uh, which is, uh, uh, is the ultrafiltration as we know uh, in, during dialysis. So here you can see that uh, uh, there is a dialysis membrane which is separating the two compartments. The red one is the blood compartment and the yellow one is the uh, dialysis compartment through which the uh, dialysis solution flows. And across the semi-permeable membrane, uh, there is movement of the fluid, extra fluid, uh, and the waste products from the blood compartment into the uh, dialysis compartment, and the dialysis solution uh, is discarded. So that's how uh, the uh, uh, waste products, the extra water and extra salt, uh, this moves out of the body. Out of the two processes which I mentioned, uh, the first uh, is diffusion and the other one is the uh, convection or ultrafiltration. The diffusion is uh, uh, actually the factors which determine diffusion is the concentration gradient, uh, the molecular weight of the a solute which needs to be removed, the rate at which these molecules move, uh, and the nature of the membrane which includes the pore size uh, and uh, the duration for which the dialysis uh, goes on uh, for which the diffusion uh, will occur. While the ultrafiltration uh, is basically uh, akin to the convection and uh, this is the uh, basically the movement of water uh, which could uh, either be uh, hydrostatic or due to an osmotic force uh, and uh, that's how the water molecules move. When the water molecules they move along with, with, the, uh, with them, the water molecules they also take these other solutes with them and this is called uh, the solvent drag. The ultrafiltration uh, rate uh, basically uh, is dependent on the pressure difference across the membrane, which we call as the transmembrane uh, pressure. So here uh, this uh, PowerPoint uh, shows how across the membrane uh, there is uh, the uh, pressure difference between the blood and the dialysis compartment uh, there is movement of uh, water, uh, the solvent, and along with there is, there is also movement of the solutes. The uh, basic uh, two concepts which we need to understand uh, is hemofiltration and uh, uh, hemodifiltration, uh, which occur across the semipermeable membrane. And uh, the hemofiltration is uh, actually uh, a pure... Uh, um, movement of ultrafiltration uh, which is driven by the uh, uh, transmembrane pressure difference uh, and when you do this hemofiltration procedure uh, which is more of a, a pressure difference related movement of the solvent uh, uh, and water, you infuse uh, uh, a replacement fluid uh, to compensate for the uh, re removed water because sometimes you have to remove excess water so that with that the other solutes also uh, come out. The other procedure is hemodifiltration where you combine both ultrafiltration and uh, the dialysis pure uh, diffusive process. So it's both diffusion and uh, ultrafiltration uh, occurring uh, together. Here, uh, the diffusive process and the uh, uh, hemodifiltration, they are shown. Hemodifiltration uh, have both the diffusive process, diffusion and uh, ultrafiltration occurring uh, simultaneously, uh, while you can have a situation where it is just pure uh, uh, diffusion uh, in the dialysis where the 
transmembrane pressure, if it is kept zero, then there would not be any ultrafiltration. This is essentially uh, a cartoon of the uh, whole hemodialysis apparatus, uh, uh, which needs uh, uh, to have an access to the blood uh, from the patient. And so that's why what we call as the uh, dialysis access or uh, and from the dialysis access, uh, the blood is drawn. The red, uh, uh, red line is the, uh, and the blue line, they form the uh, circuit of blood. And the blood uh, through a pump is going into the uh, dialyzer, which is basically a filter ha having a, a semi-permeable membrane. And uh, from the dialyzer or the filter, uh, the blood is returned back to the patient. So it's a continuous process. The blood is running uh, into the dialyzer and uh, is going back into the patient. And the other compartment uh, which I sh uh, shown in the early slide uh, is the dialysate compartment in which the dialysate is continuously running uh, and uh, uh, across the same permeable membrane, diffusion and ultrafiltration, uh, they are uh, occurring. And this is essentially uh, the way the ultrafiltration and diffusion, they occur. Uh, and uh, the process of dialysis is used to remove waste products, uh, the excess water and excess uh, uh, salt from the body. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, machine uh, dialysis, hemodialysis machine uh, in which the f filter and the tubing uh, is, uh, and the machine is connected to the vascular axis uh, from which the blood uh, goes into the dialyzer and is returned back uh, into the patient. The hemodialysis membrane uh, uh, could be of uh, different types. Uh, depending on the uh, uh, composition of the membrane, the surface area, uh, there could be some uh, ch uh, charge on the membrane. Uh, the size of the pores may be different. So this all actually uh, determines the properties uh, uh, of the membrane. And this will uh, also uh, determine the uh, diffusive and ultrafiltration cap capabilities of the membrane. Uh, the membrane is uh, made of artificial material. Uh, initially, membranes were mainly of cellulose acetate, but now we have membranes uh, which are much more biocompatible and they produce uh, very little reaction or no reaction when they come in contact uh, with the blood components. The <coughs> The Dialy dialyzers uh, and the tubes uh, actually can also be reused uh, for the same patient. And for the reuse of the dialyzers and membrane, uh, one have needs to really flush out the blood at the end of the dialysis and then fill them up with uh, a disinfect solution. Uh, and when it is going to be reused, uh, uh, they are again flushed and uh, uh, so that the disinfect solution is washed off. Uh, this reuse is done uh, with the idea that the volume of the blood compartment in the dialyzer uh, it, it doesn't come down to uh, less than 80% uh, of the original blood volume. This is to ensure uh, that the clearance of the dialyzer is uh, at least 90% uh, or above uh, the original uh, clearance. Uh, the membranes, as I was mentioning, uh, they can be divided into uh, cellulosic membrane, which were cellulose acetate or cuprofen, uh, but their use has declined. Then there are semi-synthetic and synthetic uh, membranes. Uh, the synthetic membranes are polyacrylonitrile and the polysulfone. Uh, the dialyzers can be, uh, mostly the dialyzers at present are hollow fiber type, uh, but there are some dialyzers which were previously in vogue, which were actually uh, in the form of plates, uh, parallel plates, uh, 
so this, uh, these are the two types of dialyzers which have been used as the dialysis and dialyzers have evolved. The <coughs> uh, dialyzers can be classified into three broad categories. One is with the conventional uh, dialyzers uh, who have solute clearances uh, uh, of smaller uh, molecule solutes which are uh, effectively removed. But the clearance of larger molecules is not that good. These are mostly the cellulose-based dialyzers. But the high flux uh, uh, dialyzers, they can remove even uh, molecules which are more than 10,000 uh, uh, Daltons. So they can remove uh, what we call as the middle molecules also uh, with uh, good efficiency. And there are high efficiency uh, or high flux uh, dialyzers which have very high hydraulic permeability uh, as well as permeabil uh, permeability to uh, high molecular weight substances, uh, creating a very highly uh, efficient and effective uh, uh, membrane. Uh, so these high flux uh, dialyzers now has been used more and more to give a very efficient and removal of uh, uh, ultrafiltrate as well. The dialysate uh, circuit, as uh, I was uh, showing uh, earlier, basically has the circuit in which the blood, as it comes out from the dialysis uh, uh, axis, which the patient has, uh, is goes into the dialyzer, uh, which is uh, uh, then uh, returned back uh, uh, to the patient through the uh, tubing. So there is a closed circuit uh, through which the blood continuously goes into the dialyzer and is then returned back. The other compartment is the uh, dialysate compartment in which the uh, dialysate fluid is made uh, generally from a concentrate uh, which is uh, in, um, available both in the liquid and uh, in the powder form. The uh, machine actually monitors for uh, the composition of the dialysate so that the dialysate as it is uh, made from the concentrated form of dialysate powder uh, should be in proper composition and this is done by measuring the conductivity of the final dialysate and also the temperature. Uh, one important aspect uh, which we need to remember is the water which is used to make the dialysate has to be very pure and now actually there is a concept of uh, using an ultra pure water. This is the reason, the, the reason being that a patient who is on dialysis on an average is exposed to almost 600 liter of water uh, which is directly coming in contact with the blood compartment across the semi-permeable membrane. So if this water uh, is uh, uh, contaminated and is not pure, uh, then there is a possibility of uh, uh, those impurities getting into uh, the blood compartments. They could be uh, pyrogens, they could be some bacterial uh, products and other trace elements. So that's why there is a concept of uh, you, uh, having an ultra pure uh, dialysate which has uh, very low and almost negligible uh, 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 contamination in terms of uh, bacterial products, uh, uh, the pyrogens and also there should not be any uh, trace elements uh, which can really uh, accumulate inside the body. So you have a very elaborate system of produce of uh, uh, preparing a pure water which is used for uh, making dialysate uh, where we have water softener, uh, then a carbon filter and then a primary uh, purification process which is most important uh, which includes uh, reverse osmosis uh, and a deionizer. So this is, uh, uh, they are actually in uh, series having uh, a filter which removes the uh, larger uh, contaminants, 
then a water softener which include removes the hardness then the carbon tanks and uh, then another 5 micron filter and after that the water goes through a reverse osmosis tank uh, where through a process of reverse osmosis uh, the water is uh, actually uh, purified and this uh, reverse osmosis uh, uh, RO treated water uh, which is uh, much pure water is then used for uh, preparing diazosate. Uh, many units will use this water, uh, store this water in a tank and then uh, uh, through a distribution system uh, it goes into the loop. What is recommended at present is that this loop should be uh, actually a continuous loop. Uh, there should not be any break uh, in between. Uh, there should not be anywhere that this water holds on. And secondly, the uh, the tubes which are used to uh, in this distribution loop of the RO purified water uh, should be uh, of PEX material, which is a very uh, compatible material and uh, it doesn't leach out any contaminations. This is the uh, water unit uh, treatment facility at our uh, institute and we have actually uh, three uh, reverse osmosis water treatment plants uh, which is providing water for running about 50 uh, uh, dialysis stations which run uh, uh, 24 hours, uh, 7 days a week. I would uh, uh, briefly sum up uh, the dialysis uh, uh, modalities into essentially intermittent form and a continuous form of dialysis. The intermittent form of dialysis is what we know, uh, the intermittent hemodialysis and then there is uh, another slow, low efficiency dialysis which is also uh, an intermittent form of uh, hemodialysis uh, and another is uh, extended daily dialysis uh, which is a hybrid therapy uh, between the uh, this slow low efficiency dialysis and one of the uh, type of uh, continuous uh, slow therapies uh, uh, of dialysis. The other is a continuous uh, dialysis modalities in which uh, one should remember uh, peritoneal dialysis and the other is the uh, so called continuous renal replacement therapy what we call a CRRD which basically runs for uh, at least uh, uh, 24 hours uh, and this uh, CRRT is generally used the continuous renal replacement therapy for uh, acute uh, kidney failure uh, uh, especially in patients who are hemodynamically uh, unstable. As I, I initially I presented the uh, uh, access uh, uh, of getting blood out from the patient into the machine uh, and this is called as the vascular access. So when we are uh, planning starting dialysis in a patient who has chronic kidney disease, we should plan for a dialysis vascular access at least six months before the anticipated start of hemodialysis. And uh, uh, because it takes two, three months before the dialysis access gets ready. Basically, the vascular access for dialysis is uh, <coughs> is made uh, by connecting an artery and a vein and this is done at the r r uh, preferably at the wrist the radial artery and one of the veins at the wrist they are connected together and the vein as it gets blood from the uh, radial from the artery uh, it really uh, gets arterialized and it gets enlarged and from this vein one draws out the blood and also returns back the blood from this uh, to the arterialized blood. Uh, earlier uh, the uh, uh, arteriovenous shunts were used when the uh, artificial slastic uh, tubings were placed into the artery and the vein but at present uh, they are no longer used so the preferred vascular axis is actually arteriovenous fistula in which the artery and the vein 
they are uh, anastomos and the other one is the arteriovenous graft because when the arteriovenous fistula fails then you put a, 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 a graft uh, which is of uh, PTFE or nowadays we have other synthetic material as well uh, and this graft is actually used as the vascular axis. So this is uh, connecting the artery and the vein but for cannulation and drawing the blood and returning you use this uh, uh, PTFE graft. About the uh, fistula, these are the various uh, options available, but the ideal is to create the fistula at the wrist, which we call as radiocephalic. Uh, but uh, if the veins are not available, then one can have other uh, sites as well, like uh, brachial uh, site or brachiobasilic or brachiocephalic. And there could be some complications in these fistula as well in the form of stenosis or thrombosis, formation of aneurysm and infections. Uh, I mentioned about the graft uh, uh, which is uh, uh, PTFE uh, also known as Gore-Tex uh, and uh, they are used for cannulating uh, and taking out uh, blood uh, for going into the dialyzer and then returning back. The grafts have higher tendency for clotting uh, and also for infections as compared to the uh, arteriovenous fistula. The venous axis is generally used for the acute uh, dialysis uh, which could be uh, putting these uh, venous catheters which are double human catheters uh, which could be cuffed and uncuffed e into the bigger veins which could be internal jugular vein, uh, the subclavian vein or, or, or the femoral vein. This is dialysate uh, composition, uh, which is the standard comp uh, composition which is used. Uh, there is a range, it has sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, uh, and then there are buffers available, acetate, bicarb, uh, uh, and glucose. Especially if you are dialyzing a diabetic patient, then uh, you should uh, uh, use a dialysate which has glucose. Uh, when you uh, are taking the blood through the dialyzer and returning back, the circuit uh, can also have a thrombotic uh, uh, tendency, so you have to use uh, an anticoagulation. So heparin is the anticoagulant which is used and it is monitored. The dose can be monitored either by the activated clotting time or by uh, APTT. The heparinization is uh, generally stopped one hour before the uh, end of the di dialysis. And it's basically uh, a systemic uh, administration of 50 to 100 units of heparin uh, per kg of the body weight uh, uh, as a bolus followed by an hourly infusion uh, of the uh, heparin to keep uh, ACT target about 50 percent above uh, above the baseline. The regional uh, heparinization is, uh, is used in patients who have uh, uh, bleeding tendencies. So you only heparinize the circuit uh, and as soon as uh, the blood is being returned back, uh, uh, the heparin is uh, uh, countered, the heparin effect is countered by uh, adding protamine, one milligram of protamine for every hundred units uh, of heparin into the venous line. One can also use dialysis, do dialysis without anticoagulation uh, by flushing saline in between and also having high uh, hemodialysis flow rates. Uh, 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 this especially in patients who have pericarditis or who have uh, bleeding tendency. Nowadays uh, more and more dialysis units are using low molecular weight heparin instead of the conventional heparin. Uh, which has been shown to uh, have better lipid profile in these patients, less osteoporosis and less of uh, pruritus. One can also use direct thrombin inhibitors and hydrodin and uh, uh, lepuridin uh, for anticoagulation. The dialysis dose is also very important uh, uh, to give adequate dialysis and there are uh, 
uh, formulas available, especially one looks at the uh, urea reduction ratio, the urea levels as they are reduced uh, pre-dialysis uh, uh, and then post-dialysis urea level. So this percentage reduction of the urea ratio uh, is also an index of uh, uh, adequacy of dialysis. The guidelines say that it should be actually uh, about 60 percent or more in terms of the reduction of the urea. The other uh, measurement uh, is the KT over V, which is basically trying to give you a number uh, in terms of the uh, removal of uh, uh, the urea from the total uh, body uh, composition. And this is based on the dialyzer clearance and the time of dialysis and the volume of total body water. And the number which is generally uh, uh, talked about is to have a KTOV of 1.2 uh, each dialysis. So if you are doing three dialysis per week, it is 3.6. The other signs of adequate dialysis is good appetite, uh, uh, good blood pressure control, uh, no fluid overload or edema, uh, no normal uh, heart size, uh, no ane uh, anemia, hemoglobin should be more than 10 and uh, serum albumin should be more than uh, 3.5. During dialysis, some of the uh, complications which are seen is uh, uh, hypotension, muscle cramp, uh, the sensorial disturbances uh, which we call as dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, uh, dialyzer reactions if the membranes are not biocompatible, cardiac irregularities, uh, hemolysis, uh, hypoglycemia, uh, hemorrhage, uh, toxic uh, water sy uh, system uh, treatment contamination, especially if we, one is not using an RO water and a PAX tubing uh, in the circuit, and then infections can rarely occur. The uh, survival on dialysis, uh, uh, what has been seen is the average mortality rate in patients on dialysis about 18 to 20 percent per year with a five-year survival rate of about 35 to 40 percent. And the most uh, important cause of uh, mortality in dialysis is cardiac disease and infections, which is responsible for about 50 percent of deaths because of cardiac disease and 15 percent of deaths uh, because of uh, infection. Patients who are older, male, uh, and uh, the uh, white population, and diabetics, those who have malnutrition and heart disease, uh, they have much poorer outcome and higher mortality. So this is the uh, dialysis uh, uh, outcome and mortality, which has shown some improvement over a period of in last 10-15 uh, years, but still the uh, outcome uh, remains uh, 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 not as good. Actually, the patient on dialysis, the outcome is uh, almost similar to a well-treated cancer. And the reason being that now more and more elderly patients and more and more patients who have diabetes and cardiac disease, uh, they are actually being considered and being kept on uh, hemodialysis. The uh, other concept which is coming up is a short uh, daily hemodialysis uh, and also uh, uh, nightly dialysis because what they have shown uh, that uh, the daily dialysis uh, is uh, actually much more efficient uh, to take care of the, uh, uh, the uremic uh, complications. And these patients who are on daily nightly dialysis, uh, their blood pressure is well controlled, uh, they don't have anemia and the bone involvement uh, is also very minimal. So this is the uh, one of the best form of giving a renal replacement therapy is a daily uh, nightly dialysis. Uh, these patients, they uh, go uh, either they are on home dialysis or they go to the dialysis units uh, for an overnight dialysis and during the daytime uh, they are actually uh, working. Lastly, I will uh, uh, talk about the concept of hemofiltration 
which is now picking up, especially hemodiafiltration, uh, which is a combination of uh, ultrafiltration and uh, diffusion, both occurring uh, in the dialysis. Uh, uh, and this uses uh, high flux membranes uh, and with very high uh, blood flow rates uh, and simultaneously large volume of uh, substitution fluid uh, is also used. Uh, and uh, this is more a physiological form of replacing the lost kidney function because if you look at uh, our kidneys, uh, the most of the purification the kidneys do is actually based on the process of ultrafiltration. So that's why uh, they have shown that by using uh, uh, high flux membranes and uh, hemodiafiltration, uh, uh, which is uh, also with high uh, f uh, replacement uh, fluid and large volume of ultrafiltration, uh, there are more benefits in terms of uh, correction of anemia, inflammation, the oxidative stress, uh, the lipid profiles, and calcium, phosphate, and bone disease. So this is uh, another form of procedure uh, using hemodiafiltration and hemofiltration uh, for uh, replacing the lost kidney patient function uh, even in end-stage uh, renal failure. Uh, I uh, briefly touched upon slow, low-efficiency dialysis uh, which is basically giving dialysis with the pump speed of just 200 ml and a dialysate flow rate which can come down to about 200 to 300 ml uh, per minute. And this is also an extended form uh, of dialysis for uh, uh, about 6 to 12 hours. This is generally used for uh, patients who have acute renal failure, but it can also be used uh, uh, for patients who have chronic renal failure uh, who are actually having unstable uh, uh, cardiac problem and who have uh, who are hemodynamically unstable and one can combine the uh, uh, these continuous form of renal replacement therapy uh, with the other uh, uh, more diffusion based dialysis therapy which is the hybrid uh, form of uh, uh, dialysis therapy. Uh, another form of uh, dialysis which is the slow continuous ultrafiltration scuff is actually used uh, in patients who have more of cardiac disease and also some renal impairment where you can uh, take care of the volume overload. So patients who have low ejection fraction uh, and uh, who have cardiac uh, disease uh, along with the kidney disease can benefit uh, uh, by the slow continuous ultrafiltration. And the lastly, uh, I will not go into the detail, uh, this is another form of dialysis in which uh, the body peritoneum acts as a semi-permeable membrane and in the body abdomen, the uh, one uh, tube, the peritoneum dialysis catheter is uh, put inside and uh, a fluid is uh, actually installed three to four times uh, every day in 24 hours and across the peritoneal membrane there is movement of the uh, solutes as well as water and salt and then that fluid which is put in the peritoneal cavity is discarded. So across this uh, normal natural uh, semipermeable membrane, the peritoneal membrane, uh, the process of uh, diffusion and also ultrafiltration takes place. So this catheter is surgically uh, or laparoscopically or uh, uh, percutaneously is put into the abdomen. These are different types of catheters shown here uh, which can be implanted into the peritoneal cavity and the PD fluid has uh, almost a similar uh, composition as the dialysate fluid. Uh, it has glucose as the osmotic agent uh, but now there are PD peritoneal dialysis fluids which have amino acids and icodextrin. Amino acid they help both uh, in ultrafiltration and also uh, they actually give nutrition to the patient as well. And icodextrin which is a glucose polymer 
can also be used uh, in place of glucose uh, as a uh, osmotic agent, especially for long dwell or the night uh, in uh, dwell of uh, uh, peritoneal uh, dialysis. And uh, there is a trend to use uh, PD solutions which are more bicarb based and also uh, peritoneal dialysis solutions uh, which have low glucose uh, degradation products uh, which do not have glucose. Uh, so that this is the average uh, composition of the PD fluid, peritoneal dialysis fluid which has sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, magnesium, chloride, lactate uh, and a glucose. Uh, the peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, protocols, they can be generally the commonest is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis as I mentioned earlier where f uh, three to four exchanges are done every day. Uh, one can do an automated uh, peritoneal dialysis by using a cycler, a machine by which during night uh, uh, about 10 to 15 liters of uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis is done and then in the daytime one does uh, one exchange using a PD fluid uh, maybe containing icodextrin. There could be a hybrid regimes combining the above two uh, protocols. Uh, this is the uh, uh, diagrammatic representation of a continuous uh, ambulatory peritoneal dialysis where during daytime, one does three exchanges, then at night time for eight to ten hours, the uh, PD fluid is put into the abdomen and the patient sleeps off. In the morning, he gets up and the PD fluid is drained out. This is the cycler, the machine uh, automated for automated uh, peritoneal dialysis, uh, which is used uh, for patients uh, uh, who have end stage kidney failure. The complications of peritoneal dialysis include uh, peritonitis, uh, exit site infection, tunnel infections, and uh, the non-infectious complications could be pain, <coughs> abdominal fullness, uh, uh, then hernias, and uh, some of the metabolic complications, uh, the catheter malfunction and obstruction, and uh, uh, malposition. Uh, some of the absolute contraindications which we should remember for doing peritoneal dialysis is the if the PD membrane has lot of adhesions and there is uh, total loss of function of uh, peritoneal membrane because of sclerosis, if there are abdominal hernias which cannot be corrected, uh, if there is abdominal wall stroma uh, or if there is a diaphragmatic fluid leak or inability to perform exchanges in absence of uh, a suitable uh, assistant. For hemodialysis, the absolute contraindication is if there is no access possible uh, to the blood compartment. Uh, so I think I would end here and uh, uh, dialysis is actually uh, uh, either peritoneal or hemodialysis. They are very life-saving procedures. Uh, for patients who have advanced stage renal failure. Uh, but dialysis and kidney transplantation, they are complementary renal replacement therapies uh, for these patients. Uh, patients, while they wait to get the kidney, they are maintained on dialysis. And after transplant, once the kidney, if it fails, then these patients again come back on dialysis. So these are very important complementary renal replacement therapies. Thank you very much.